Father God, I just want to thank you so much for another day that you have given to us. Lord, each day, each breath is a blessing from you. It's a gift from you. And I just thank you so much for allowing us to be here today. God, I thank you for, for your love and for your mercy and grace. God, you have forgiven us and you have given us new life through Jesus Christ. And we just thank you for that this morning. We praise you for that today, God. Lord, I, I just want to lift up all these ones to you uh, that are in special need today. Lord, I want to continue to remember Kathy's family as they recently lost her grandson. And for, the, for Paula's family as uh, Rick uh, Sparks passed away this weekend. God, I just pray that you just bring peace and strength to these families. Comfort their, their souls, we pray. God, I know there are many who need a special touch from you, those who are sick, uh, those who are struggling. I, I pray for uh, Jim's uh, kids, Lord, their families. Uh, Lord, I pray for Jim and Norma and for Bob and Nancy, for Irvin and Carol. Uh, Lord, there's, like I said, Lord, there's so many that, that you know all about them. God, you know all of our unspoken requests. You know what is weighing heavy on our hearts today. And God, I pray that you just meet those needs according to your will so that good may come from these things. God, I pray that you use all these things that, uh, that people may be a testimony for you, a living testimony and example for you through these difficult times. That you use these things that people may see their need for you. God, I do pray for all of our unsaved loved ones. I pray that you convict their hearts, that they, they hear the truth, that they believe the truth, that they, uh, that they accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that they repent of their sins. Lord, I pray that you use us to, uh, to be the ones to speak the truth. Lord, give us the strength and the boldness and the conviction to do so. God, I pray for this country. I pray for our first responders as they are dealing with, with things that, that they've probably never seen in their lifetimes, uh, or at least in the positions that they're in. Uh, Lord, I pray that you keep them safe. I pray that you give their families peace. I pray that you give the first responders strength and courage to do what they are called to do, Lord. I pray that, that, um, that you give them the wisdom and the, the strength to do what is right in the heat of the moment. Lord, I pray for all of our leaders. I pray that you just give them godly wisdom and that they listen to that godly wisdom and, and follow through, that they do what they have been put there and ordained by you to do. God, I pray that they lead this country in, in the way that we should go. Lead us back to you, Lord. I pray for all of our our pastors, religious leaders, that, that we are, are bold and that we are able to, to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ with boldness and conviction, Lord. Lord, help us all to, to be what you have called each one of us to be. Thank you for allowing us to be here once again and for just for, for all that you've done for us and continue to do. Lord, may you bless this service as, as what we say and do is all about you today. God, we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. If you're able to, please stand and turn to page 364.
So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth, from the greatest to the least of them. Then word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. 
Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we just come to you once again, and I thank you for your word, for, for all the, the examples we have from your word that we can learn from today. God, I thank you for your spirit. God, I pray that through your word and your spirit that you speak to us today. God, we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Nineveh was a very, very wicked city. If we uh, read later in Nahum, uh, Nahum also uh, speaks of Nineveh. It talks about the sinfulness of Nineveh, violence, sexual immorality, and sorcery. Sounds a lot like the United States of America today. And not only, I don't want to pick on the United States because it seems to be global. Talk about a global pandemic. Wickedness is a global pandemic. So, for such a time as this, in this point in history, God sees Nineveh's wickedness. He is going to destroy them unless they repent. And he picks out Jonah, of all people. He raised up Jonah for this time to go and, and preach to this wicked, evil city. And I'm sure you know the story by now. Jonah, of course, did not want to go and I mean, who could blame them? I mean, if there was a city, and, and I won't, won't get into the details, but if you go to Nahum chapter 3, the, the first uh, four verses, I believe, it, it tells uh, of the, the violence and the wickedness in the city. An extremely violent, like gruesomely violent city. Who in their right mind would want to leave their home, the comfort of their home, and go to such a wicked city where who knows what is going to happen to you. But honestly, it doesn't even say that that's what Jonah was worried about. The reason that Jonah didn't seem to want to go to Nineveh was because Jonah knew that they would repent. Jonah did not want Nineveh to repent. All the Ninevites as enemies. And quite frankly, we can do the same thing in our day and age. There's right and left. There's good and bad. There's there's evil, there's, uh, there's this side and that side for every possible issue. It just seems like one thing after another after another comes up that is divisive, that is dividing us. I don't know if there's a single issue in our nation today that everybody is going to agree on. If this side says yes, this side says no. If this side says up, this side says down. We just cannot seem to, to come to any kind of agreement and unity. And a lot of people are viewing the other side as enemies. Just as Jonah viewed the Ninevites. They were the enemies. They were wicked and they did not deserve God's mercy. 
But God viewed the Ninevites in a different way. God sent Jonah to warn them. Why would God possibly want to warn the Ninevites? Because they were such a terrible, wicked people. Because God did not view the Ninevites as Jonah viewed the Ninevites. He did not view them as enemies, but instead God viewed the Ninevites as his creation. God created the people in Nineveh just as he created the people of Israel, just as he has created each one of us today. He loves his creation. For God so loved the world. Amen? Amen? God didn't just love this group or that group or this nation or that nation. He loved the world so much that he sent his only begotten son that whoever believes should not perish but have everlasting life. God viewed them as his creation whom he loved. He did not want them to be completely and utterly destroyed. But if they did not repent, that was going to be what would happen. <coughs> of course, the thing that we usually think of with Jonah is the fact that, that he rebelled against God. That, that he refused to do what God told him to do. And so, instead of going this way to Nineveh, he went this way to Tarshish. And while he was out on the, the ship, this great storm came. And Jonah knew that it was because of him. Everybody else was praying to their gods, and they, they woke Jonah up. He was Sleeping, He was so distressed, he just wanted to, to be away from reality, apparently. He was sleeping in the midst of this turbulent storm and said, Pray to your God that, that we might be saved. Maybe he'll listen to you, or maybe your God will listen. And so, Jonah knew. He knew it was about him, and he knew what had to be done. He knew that he had to be thrown into the sea and the storm would be still. So he was. He was thrown overboard and the, the storm came to an end. Everything was better. But instead of Jonah dying, I think a lot of times the, the message comes across as, as the great fish that swallowed Jonah was, was a consequence. But Jonah getting swallowed by that great fish was actually a second chance. If he just would have been left out in the middle of the sea, he surely would have died. But God provided that great fish to swallow Jonah. And it was while he was in the belly of that great fish that he prayed and he repented. He made the choice that he would go and preach to the Ninevites. And so the great fish spews him out onto the shore. It says it was a, a three-day walking journey to Nineveh from where he was, but he made it in one day. Now that is hustle. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess, you know, if you experienced what Jonah experienced, you would just want to, to get it done and over with too. God used Jonah to preach to the Ninevites. As reluctant as he was, he used Jonah 
to preach to the Ninevites. And we do see that the Ninevites repented. The nation of Nineveh repented. They turned back to God. They turned away from their wicked ways. But then I, of course, mentioned Nahum. The prophet was also sent to give word to Nineveh about a hundred years or so after Jonah because Nineveh had returned to its wicked ways. But during the time that they were in good standing with God, God actually used the, the, the repented Nineveh to pass judgment on an unrepentant Israel. It was during that time that, that God had Nineveh conquer Israel and capture the inhabitants. God was using everybody in play. And even though Jonah ended up doing what he was supposed to do all along because he was shown mercy, even though Jonah was shown mercy, he still didn't get it. It seems the only reason that he preached to the Ninevites was because at that point he felt like he had to. Jonah still thought that only certain people or certain groups would or should receive God's mercy. While he was grateful for his mercy, and by his mercy, through his mercy, he obeyed God, at the end of the book of Jonah we see that Jonah was still all about himself. He took this nice spot in hopes of watching God destroy Nineveh. He wanted to have the best seat in the house. He was still hoping that God would destroy that city. And so he took a place in the hot sun and and God allowed shade to grow, and uh, he was grateful for that. But then a worm came, and, and by morning that shade was gone, and the heat and the wind just beat on him. And he just, he wanted to die at that point. Because of what was happening to him, this, this uh, minute, Thing that happened to him. God taking away his shade and, and Nineveh not being destroyed. He didn't want to live through that any longer. Unfortunately, Christians can be a lot like Jonah. We are grateful for the mercy that has been shown to us. I think we could all raise our hands today and say that we are grateful for the mercy that God has shown upon us because we are we've we've all been sinners we're all sinners but we're saved by grace because of his great mercy not because any of us have deserved it but because God's favor showed up, uh, upon us because we have believed on the name of Jesus Christ. But so many Christians, while they are grateful for the mercy that God has shown on them, they want or expect God's judgment on those evildoers. If God would just show his judgment and take care of them, they are the enemies. They don't deserve mercy. But wait a second. 
What about us? Our sins have been no worse than their sins. We still have been separated by God because of our sins. And it is only because of his mercy and grace that we can be reconciled to him. Yes, they are sinners. But just like the Ninevites were a very, very terribly, gruesomely wicked people, the people that that we might see as our enemies were also created by God. And God loves them. And God wants those people to repent and come to him. He doesn't desire that any should perish, but that all would have everlasting life. God has shown that judgment does come to the unrepentant. Of course, back even in Genesis, we read about the flood that destroyed the entire world except for one family and, and the select animals. We also see the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Why did God destroy the world? Why did God destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? It was, it was because of the wickedness that abounded. But just like the story of Nineveh had, had a main character in Jonah, Sodom also had a main character that we read about. And his name was Abraham. Well, while Jonah eventually reluctantly preached, yet desired judgment for those people, Abraham bargained with God because he desired that the people of Sodom and Gomorrah would be saved. Even though they in fact, deserved judgment. If you remember, Abraham pleaded with God, God, if there just be 50 righteous men, will you save that land? God says, yes, for 50 I will. God, God, forgive me. Please be patient with me. I humbly ask if there are 40 righteous men, Will you save that land? Yes, for 40, I will save them. Okay, God, forgive me. Humbly, 30, 20, 10. If there are just 10 righteous men in the land, will you have mercy upon them? For 10 righteous men, I will Relent. I will hold back my judgment from the land. But there were not ten righteous men in the whole land to be found. Here in America, throughout the world, we see great wickedness. We have many, many, many divisions the sins that brought destruction to these cities that we read about or to the world in Genesis are the same wicked things that are flooding America and the world today violence and sexual immorality and sorcery We deserve God's judgment. It is only going to be by his mercy and grace and, and repentance that we don't see God's judgment. We can't rightly ask God to bless America until America returns to blessing God.
but it just takes one person to be the messenger, to be the voice that God is using to preach repentance and mercy. And a great move of God. God has to be in it. The Spirit of God must move within the hearts of the people to bring us back to repentance. Revival starts within Christians' hearts, but, but a great awakening has to happen for a people who, who are just completely blinded to the truth. There are a lot of people who call themselves Christians, but their lives show that they are far from it. God used the prophets in the Old Testament with Israel time and time again to show that repentance is not a one and done situation. Yes, Israel repented, but then they turned away, and God handed them over to their enemies. They repented again, and God showed mercy, and we see that over and over again. We see with Nineveh, this great wicked city, that they repented, and God had mercy on them, and God even used them as judgment on Israel who was unrepentant at the time. But then we see again that Nineveh returned to their wicked ways. And if we read through Nahum, we, re we read that their destruction was great. While, while God used Nineveh to conquer Israel and take them captive, when Nineveh went back to their old wicked ways, they were just reduced to a pile of rubble. They were completely destroyed. Repentance is not a one and done thing. It's not something that happened however many years ago, so now we don't have to worry about it anymore. Now we can go live our lives however we please. When God confronts us with sin in our lives, we must acknowledge it and admit it. Ask forgiveness and turn away from it. There are millions and millions of people that are headed for an eternity in hell if they do not repent of their sins and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We call ourselves Christians, which means that we have been saved by God's grace and mercy from his judgment. Nineveh was spared. Jonah didn't seem to learn his lesson. Jonah was all about himself. Yet in the account of Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham was all about the lost. The ones that were headed for, for destruction and judgment. So the question I must ask you and, and even myself today is what are you all about? Are you all about yourself? I've been saved. Now I can just cruise right through the gates of heaven when it is my time to go? Or are you all about the lost in this world today? This life we have been given, it's, 
It's not from ourselves. We did not create ourselves. We did not choose to be here. Every breath we take is, is a gift from God. This life is a gift from God. Salvation is a gift from God. So none of, none of this life is ours. We are just stewards of the time we have while we are on this earth. What are we going to do with it? Let's stand if, if you're able to. Um, we're going to close with a word of prayer. God, God, forgive us for, for any sin that is in our lives. Lord, I pray that you confront us with our, our own sins, convict us of our sins, and God, I pray that we Acknowledge them, admit them to you, ask forgiveness, and turn away from them. God, I pray that you use us, and I pray that we are willing vessels to be used by you, that, that we may go and share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ with a lost and dying world. But God, there can be no good news without there being bad news also. God, give us the strength and courage to tell them that there is bad news and that there is trouble coming unless we repent. God, may we not be ashamed to speak the name of Jesus Christ. Because it is the only name through which a person may have eternal life. It is the only name by which we must be saved. By which we can be saved. God, do a mighty work in our hearts. And do a mighty work in this nation and across the world. We pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said,